turn this up and say, hi, you're on KNYOLP in Fort Bragg. How can I help you? Hey, Marco. It's Zeke. Hi, Zeke. I've been expecting your call. Uh-huh. How have you been? Well, I'm glad I called in. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> I just... got to hear some of the radio, uh, but then uh, this, then it just uh, started stuttering again. But I did get to hear Mitch talk about uh, Hurricane Irma in Florida and uh, North Korea. And that's when it started stuttering, and uh, I had to keep clicking on the refresh link uh, every you few know, minutes. It, it, it seems to me that if if whatever you're using for, for Internet access, and I understand that you're using an antenna and a USB uh, um, wireless dongle in the window overlooking yeah. overlooking a coffee shop that has... Um, that has wireless web access available, and you've uh-huh. got like one bar most of the time, no more than one bar. No, I got, I got five bars right now, so I think it might be a, it might be the, the operating system itself. You know, Windows is not so great. <laughs> You're telling me you got five bars, and you and it's still not coming in right. Right, and uh-huh. I can connect to other pages, but uh-huh. um, uh, I for uh, until. Um, the first time when I loaded Windows, when I got home, um, it didn't even recognize Wi-Fi 2. It was non-existent in the networking uh, page. And I rebooted it, and then it showed up. So I think it's partly a Windows problem. Suppose you go to someplace else that streams audio and see if you see if it comes in well for you there. Does that work for yeah, you? Yeah, I can try that, yeah. Uh, try it another time. You've, you've, you've got a story to read. Is that? Do I understand that correctly? Yeah. Okay, uh, just just give me some idea. I know that you said in your email that your story was like eight thousand words, or eight, no, eight pages. Eight pages. That's that's different. Um, mm-hmm. Can you uh, can you make an intelligent decision about where to break that and break it in two or three parts, and then and then stop oh, whenever easily. you pick a yeah. good pick a good time to break it, and then uh, and then just start. And when whenever you're ready, then get my attention. I'm going to cook something over here. Okay. <laughs> Shall I go now? Sure. All right. This piece is called Hilarious Respite. Opens with an email. Date, Wednesday, 23 July, 2014. Subject, Hilarious Respite. From me to Eleanor. July 22nd. L, this is going to crack you up so bad you'll need to breathe into a paper sack. To cease your hiccuping laughter. Just moments ago, around 7.20 p.m., I had recently returned from Bean There Coffee House, and I hear Larkin's golden voice just outside my window. For me, his audacious timber upon these needful eardrums is always a blessing, no matter the context. So I fling aside the curtain and peer out to see him and housemate Zachary schmoozing with an elderly gentleman who is blatantly drunk. Actually, Zachary just stood there grinning while Larkin poured it on sick, sucking up to the old coot with hugs, fist bumps, arm shakes, and affectionate words of camaraderie, including an invite to hang with him at Twin Peaks Tavern. So I hollered down at them. You rock, Larkin. Yeah, that's right, Twin Peaks Tavern. I was boisterous, but the traffic offered me serious competition. So I continued to bellow even louder. Larkin is a sweet man. You are so lucky to have his attention. Still no reaction. I persisted. Hey, Zachary, nice to see you again. The patsy then looked up at me and laughed at the absurdity of the situation. Then just as quickly dropped his attention to focus once more on Larkin and Prey. P-R-E-Y. Which O.J. de Mon Amour continued to grace the geriatric rooster with subtle touches and words of endearment as I observed his targeted methodology. I wouldn't be ignored, so echoed in fervent glee. That's right, Larkin, suck up to those lonely old fags with lumpy wallets. You got my approval 100%. That is when Larkin glanced up and displayed a face of exasperation. Nonetheless, gloriously handsome. Seeing as he had not one whit of control over my sudden apparition from stage left, he simply turned away and began marching towards Castle Street, a half block further up. 
the drunken Methuselah seemed so captivated by Larkin's charisma, not a single word of mine reached his ear. Thus, he never turned around, never saw me, totally oblivious to this parallel overlay. At his age, I'm sure audio capacities are limited. Larkin always seems to have the luck of the Irish on his side. I saw my wyvern's legs beneath a shop awning as he patiently waited for Zachary to catch up. But I pressed on, though he stood six doors up now. My echo cannot be ignored. I didn't mean to drive you away, Larkin. You know I love you. So you mooch off of the obese billfolds. Billfolds of tipsy old queers. Far be it from me to condemn you. Larkin didn't move. His legs remained steadfast. But I knew he heard my every word. Finally, the doddering barfly moved along with Zachary, and they were soon out of sight. I decided a few minutes later to stroll on down to Jane Warner Plaza and hang out smoking a ciggy while Larkin performed his hustle on this or that gray-haired or bald patron. But alas, he wasn't there, so I returned Hovel to reflect upon this silly imbroglio. I don't think it was by accident that Larkin showed up almost beneath my window that I could play the jilted amigo, nor do I think it was kismet alone that set me up for the perfect sting. In fact, I am convinced that he intentionally played out the script according to his own intent. Why, you may ask? To honor me by making himself vulnerable, just as he did when he fell down the metro steps last month as I chastised him from above and he hollered, Fuck you, Zeke. I meant to complete an email this piece last night, but new friend and neighbor, Gabe, dropped by to present me with a blue rose. More on that later. It's now 5.25 a.m. I woke up a half hour ago and decided to finish this report and send it off. Zeke. Let me backtrack a bit now, crepusculous reader, to when I was still hanging at being there and doing my internet chores. Gabe shows up about two hours after my arrival and plunks the netbook upon the table right beside yours truly. Of course, I was so glad to see him and that he wanted to test the device when it had access to really good wireless. Our building lacked such benefit in spite of San Francisco's attempt to provide Wi-Fi to the Castro. Their mistake was letting AT&T run the show. Gabe was such good company, and I was delighted to show him how well the netbook works when decent Wi-Fi is available. He turned me on to his Facebook page and the excellent photos and videos therein. One pic displayed his almost naked body, but for a speedo-type garment that was terry cloth thick. He also had a hairless torso, unlike the present gray hairs that now poke above the collar. You shave your chest, I exclaimed. How old is this photo? 2011, he replied. Most of the photos of Gabriel showed him minus his present swatch of gray hair. But at least I know now for sure he has one hell of a handsome figure. So much so I'm surprised I didn't get a Woody right then and there. After about an hour or so, I finally depart, leaving him to peruse cyberspace without my backseat driving presence. For in his exuberant gestures, he is full of piss and vinegar. I kind of panicked over the splashes of water from his drink that threatened to short-circuit the rejuvenated netbook. I even grabbed a few more napkins that he'd keep the table dry and safe from destroying his new, though second-hand, device. Now, let's skip forward to just after my latest and risible encounter with Larkin and Patsy just below my window. Once returned Hubble from my failed attempt to vex Larkin by Twin Peaks Tavern, there was a gentle knock on my door. So I declare before opening, I wonder who that is. Could it be my fantastic friend Gabe? Of course it was him. No one else in 2306 cares about me one whit. Holding a long stem rose colored blue with purple tinges, I was terribly charmed. And then there's a picture where, with caption, I found this incredible vase on the back porch three days after Gabe presented me with the rose. Click on image for a larger view. Please realize this photo was taken with my Android tablet since my digital camera was stolen by a visitor about five weeks ago. Thus, not the clarity I wish to share. The rose is dyed a deep blue with purple edges with the petals curl. An exquisite gift 
from from an exquisite man. The fact the fact the rose is mostly blue comes from my telling him some of my many legends of the blue rose. Yesterday, I think, but perhaps today, and that such a color for rose does not exist in nature, but came from my own visions of the Ice Age and the world of Neanderthals. Here are some of the tales in condensed form I passed on to Gabriel. One, my first vision of the Blue Rose occurred in 1996 when I was napping in my humble SRO. I saw two angels standing by the curtain off to my right. I have two windows in my room. One angel was sewing a blue rose into the white gauze mesh, while the other angel stood by and observed the handiwork. I stood up from desk number two and approached them. The angel who needle-pointed the rose paused and spoke. We want you to sew a blue rose just like this, that people walking the street may see it, one if by land, two if by sea. Oh, no, I exclaimed. I don't have the talent to do that. Could I possibly paint it on a square of cardboard and place it in the window? Yes, that will work nicely. After that incredible vision, I researched the spiritual meaning of the blue rose, but really found nothing pertinent on the web other than its Celtic value as a mystical symbol, as perhaps an impossible quest, nonetheless fulfilled. Years passed until I acquired its true meaning. It came to me in visions, nothing that could be discovered via library resources or internet searches. The many legends of the Blue Rose, as I shall call this collection, which I have yet to complete or even begin, were born of prehistoric adventures when ice ruled the planet and Neanderthals were king. Okay, I I'm stopping here, Marco. Marco, can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I was, I was out. Now I'm back. Yeah. Well, okay. this is this is halfway through. Uh, so um, you, can you know what that is? That isn't very long. You just started like ten minutes ago. Why don't you just finish it now? Do you okay, want, sounds do, good. Do you want I to do shall that? Continue. Go ahead. Two. This seraphic vision directly led to my inspiration to found the world's first gay militia back in 1997, the Blue Rose Militia, dedicated to, quote, fighting for the rights of same-sex lovers across the globe and into the 21st century, unquote. You may read that essay here, and I give a link. Three, some years later, visions of Neanderthals on a quest for the rare Blue Rose that only grows on the edge of glaciers began haunting my nocturnal hours. It was an act of true love, a sacrifice through many months seeking this unique flower, that discovering one and bringing it back, if you didn't die of exposure or a beast, which often occurred, guaranteed that the target of your adoration could not turn you down. Four, later visions reveal Cro-Magnon encroaching upon the habitat of Neanderthal, pillaging, raping, and destroying this earlier species, and cannibalizing them as if they were just another form of wild animal. Yet some crow magnons came to see such violence as a great crime of the soul, for they realized that they and Neanderthal were brothers under the skin. And so they became the first civil rights activists in history. Not just that, but LGBT activists too, for Neanderthal was highly homosexualized. These earlier men could not conceive the brutality wrought upon their kind, for they were telepathic and already regarded Cro-Magnon as kin. For some time, these compassionate Cro-Magnons, barely 1% of the total species, would protect this Neanderthal remnant by hiding them out in distant caves way high up the mountains and bring them food, beverage, clothing, gifts, and friendship. Some even fell in love, thus secret trysts abounded. Sadly, these hidden places were eventually exposed by traitorous Cro-Magnons, and the remaining Neanderthal survivors were all killed, along with their beloved Cro-Magnon allies. Yet before their tragic demise, certain chiefs of the Neanderthal tribes had made their quest of the Blue Rose and presented the gift to their Cro-Magnon comrades. 
Thus, this vision revealed to me the true meaning of the blue rose, the promise one day of harmony between two different species of man. Five, actually not all Neanderthals have been wiped out, for there remain two separate tribes totaling 467 in two remote and covert locations in Siberia. I know this only through visions and from a secret society called the Arctic Circle Federation of Warlocks. Actually, that's not quite the title, but close. They are a direct lineage from these original Cro-Magnon activists, whose only communicate with yours truly has been through telepathy thus far. They do not reveal to me why these Neanderthals are split into two locations, nor tell me of any of the treasures they guard except for five remaining dragons who all abide together in the same cavern under sea. Suffice it to say they originated the myth of the Loch Ness Monster to conceal from the world the actual home of these wyvern beauties. Six, some months after my Neanderthal vision came visions of a great warrior chief out of ancient Thrace whose name was Sabazios, after their skyfather god and as hero to the Greeks back then, and who lost his dearest friend and lover in battle, so was pining for new love to end, or at least ease, his grief. Yet in spite of his heroic deeds and great affection of all the villages he ruled over and protected with absolute fealty, not one of his superb warriors ever came forth to propose. And this struck our hero's heart like a poisoned tip spear. He would often weep in a hidden glade bordering upon the tribe's territorial perimeter. All creatures would cease their chattering, bellows, groans, chirps, and grunts, for here was truly a man for whom tears are no shame. Yea, those tears are the waters gushing from Zybothyrdos' own grief, whom the Athenians called Zeus. And he would pray to the great goddess Bendis, Artemis, as the Corinthians called her, I have sacrificed my life for our people many times over, yet no one cares enough to bed with me. I am still the most handsome and brave of them all, even when you consider our entire legacy of kings. What curse is this on their souls, that they grow shy like fawns from honoring what I most need and I know deserve all too well, especially if I am to continue my sacred duty to protect and defend with utmost ferocity. So Sebastios determined to satisfy his need by questing for the Blue Rose all by his lone self. Now, my Entrecote reader, these angels who give me such visions refuse to tell me precisely how the Blue Rose managed to survive well beyond the end of the Ice Age. <clears throat> Perhaps there are just a few dozen remaining of that species astride the top of an ice-chilled mountain. I just don't know. But there they were, sometime in the 9th century B.C. Long story short, upon his return, Sabazios expressed undying love for one Brassus, a most brave warrior who was a glorious auburn of purple irises flecked with green and black, of course deliciously buffed, thickly hung, and a leopard in the barley stack and really super affectionate after just two horns of fermented sheep milk. But when our hero fell on both knees, wept in the startled man's toga, and presented him with the rose, Brassus threw up his skirt and ran away beyond the furthest village in the kingdom, neither to be seen nor heard of again. Well, that broke the king's spirit beyond mending. So he spoke these words in his final visit to the secluded glade. Oh, my creator, Zybothyrdos, my people have fallen into depravity and wickedness. They have no heart, no strong love, no gratitude for my devoted sacrifices that they may survive and be joyful. I must leave the village I once so cherished and protect it, for my shame in them is beyond measure. I cannot look at a single one of them in the face. Then he wandered off into the forest, far, far beyond where any Thracian had hunted. Sabazios lived off his hands and remained unknown to any other human until the day he died, six years later, destitute and brokenhearted. The end, unless you tell of his reincarnation into a gay activist in turn-of-the-century San Francisco, and his final search for true love ends in the arms of one 
Locke and Kelsey. Much to his delight and eternal gratitude to Seibel Sertos. If you'd like, Herudian reader, you may learn about ancient Thracian religion at the following site. It is quite enlightening, though you won't find any tale like mine therein. 7. This final legend of the Blue Rose had to do with Jesus Christ, or at least the crown of thorns he wore during his crucifixion. For that crown was not made of any ordinary rose bush, but of the Blue Rose itself. Imagine what distant, hard scrabble tundra Roman soldiers had to traverse to acquire such a precious bramble. When the Roman guards prepared Christ's crown, they stripped away all the leaves and buds till only branch and thorns remained, yet they missed one tiny bud barely pushing out from the xylem. It grew almost into a petite blossom while trapped atop a dying man nailed to the cross. But when Nicodemus and Joseph lowered Jesus into the tender arms of his mother, this solitary bud popped away from the thorns and tumbled some distance across the dusty ground, planting its roots at last once the next storm arrived. And soon it did, within moments. More to the story at a later time. I just wanted to give some examples, though the Neanderthal and Thracian portions were quite a doozy, eh? And that is the end. Got it. That is a, that is a doozy. I, I know about the the root of the root of doozy is Duesenberg. It was a kind of car that nobody could afford, not even the richest of the rich. And then somehow a few of them managed to get one. So if a thing was really great and wonderful, it was a doozy. That was what they called that. Oh, wonderful! That, that, I didn't know that. That's, that's what it is. That's where that, that came that's excellent. from. Excellent. I love. It. I love. Uh, how have things how have things been going for you this week, Zeke? Oh, well, the heat wave was horrible. Just horrible. I'm still recovering. So grateful for this cold weather. I am. Um, I, I I have always suffered from hot weather. You know, and uh, yeah, I get panic attacks and all these negative issues just go. You know, and I just I just hate going through it. You know, and 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 so I know where really to go. My room, you know, face the two windows of my room face south. So as the day got started to cool off, my room stayed hot. So it, it, it was. Uh, the only thing nice about it is when it starts to get cool again, it renews my appreciation for the wonderful foggy weather for which San Francisco is so uh, notorious. Well, if it ever happens uh, again... Things are going well with Zach, yes. He's, uh, he, he's taken my advice to heart, and he's, gotten, he's taken care of things very well. As I said, he would follow up, and I'm glad to see it. And, oh, my, my, my neighbor died. Michael... Um, he moved in about three and a half years ago. He lives right next door to me. Uh, he was only 48. Now, he's the one I call Gabriel in my story that I just read. Al, he's the only person who's been friendly to me in this building since, since I had someone else who was friendly who moved out 10 years ago. What killed him? I don't really know. They say he, just, he looked at the picture of perfect health a week before he died when I saw him. It's not that, that, that close, but he is nice to me, and sometimes we chat on the hallway. But he has started renting about, about six months ago to people to help pay the rent, the sheriff. So there are different people coming and going. It all seem cool or whatever. Um, but I just find it kind of eerie and a little suspicious. I don't want to, you know, project. How long ago? How long ago did he die? It. When? Yeah. About a week and a half ago. And you don't know what killed him. Nope, I, the manager didn't say much, and I'm not going to pry because uh, what good is that? I don't know. It, it can't hurt to ask. I did, and I didn't get get much. And, he didn't uh, want to tell you. I imagine since he had you know contacted the relatives and stuff that you know he may not feel like it's appropriate to go into details to someone else. I don't know. Do you? Uh, I, I think we uh, we emailed at some point, and you said something about being able to get media, you know, television shows and uh, and movies yeah. and uh, and comic books. Can you also get comic book series on, on the web somehow? Yes, you just uh, well, um, you can. The best site I think to go to is um, uh, Kick Ass Torrents. Yeah, right. yeah. But the the it, pirate bay still works. I was just going to recommend a couple of uh, a couple of comic book series that I I know that you will like. One of them is Transmetropolitan. 
Trans Metropolitan. Okay. Um, it's uh, it's Hunter Thompson in the future. Oh, great. Well, it, I don't have to jot this down because I'll be uh, downloading the information from your podcast in a day or two. <laughs> if you like. Also, uh, also one by Mobius, who did a lot of work for Heavy Metal Magazine, and also that was just one of his outlets. There's a, a several hundred page long um, uh-huh. a series called The Incal, I-N-C-A-L. Mm-hmm. It, it just it's superb, and you know it's you know thirty years old, thirty forty years old now. But just about every science fiction movie that's come out since then has oh. borrowed something you know important from it. Just to totally yeah. totally ripped off. They were all his ideas, and uh, and another one is called Tom Strong. Ah, that rings a bell, but I'm not sure. Um, I had a comic book reader. I can get it again. I did find places that had these old comic books, but they were they were like um, the thirties and forties from the from the deep south and stuff. They were very trashy and racist and stuff. Uh, so I sort of get, gave up on uh, collecting old comic books. Yeah, well, you're, you're going to need a you're going to need a program that you have Windows in your computer or, or do you use Linux? I have both. Uh huh. Well, there's I several up Linux from a little USB. Well, a, a little mini USB stick. There are several free comic book reading programs that will read all the you know comic book formats. That, that yeah, I'm familiar with them. I, I I can find them real easily. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything Even else that Linux and Windows, anything yeah. else that you wanted to tell me? I'm going to go forward here if you don't. No, no. This has been fine. Been fine calling in and uh, uh, great uh, uh, talking to you again. And we'll do it again in the future. Next week, if you uh, you send me an indication of what you'd like me to read, I'll read it. And then the week after that, I'll be right where I am now, and you can call again. <laughs> well, at least something in this in the, in this world is is uh, predictable. It's not just predictable; it is rock solid. I've been doing this for <laughs> doing this for Good twenty twenty right. years. Everything has to break, or you know, I'm, I've never missed an air date. Okay, see you later, uh-huh. Zeke. Take care of yourself, and I'll, I'll talk to you okay, again soon. Okay, I will. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.